you know, situations are being created where God is necessarily going to bring out those who truly love him and bring them out of the churches. Now, what do you mean by that? Bring them out of the churches. I mean that situations are uh, being created where we are going to find ourselves not having buildings and, and places in which to worship. And uh, it will be, it won't be because God has given up on the church. It's because God is needing that those who have been drinking in the spirit of God, those who have been walking in this light, God is going to put his people in situations where they're going to be closer to the people. They're going to come in contact uh, with the people. A story is told of a man uh, who walked into a church, uh, a group of men, and they walked in and they had their guns and they started shooting in the church. And all of a sudden people were scared and, and, and cowering back. And the man said, I need all the Christians to please stand up. And he started shooting the gun again. And all of a sudden, maybe one would stand up here and one would stand up there. And he kept shooting and, and, and another one would stand up here. And maybe about five or six or so stood up in this huge building. And then he said, I want everyone else to get out of here. And they started shooting and everybody just ran out. And so they were wondering what was going to be left to the five. And it is said that they put their guns down and says, well, now it's time to have church. You know, since, since you're the only ones who came to have church, I wanted to have church with real Christians. And while that may bring humor to it to some extent, the reality is, is that there are people on the outside who want to come in contact with the truth of God. But how they will be treated at churches is why many of them stay away. Many of them don't understand. Um, and situations are being created where Christianity as a whole is being looked down upon. Um, more and more as things are happening in society, people are starting to feel uh, less and less as though God is not concerned. And they're looking at these, uh, um, uh, this chaos and they're looking at the mayhem as evidence that God is not real. And yet all of this is speaking to not God's inability to save, but to Satan's enmity and hatred for humanity. And in spite of it, God is working and yet God is des desiring to bring us, those who are receiving the truth, closer to the people so that they can see the power of God being demonstrated in the lives of those who truly have embraced, as John says, and first, matter of fact, we'll come back here, but notice what the scripture says in first epistle of John, chapter one, uh, the first epistle of John in chapter one, and we want to look at verse one, and he also writes this when he's writing the gospels uh, in chapter one, he gets to a point, and again, we, we contemplate that John is not writing this in the present, in a sense. He's He's reflecting on what they have come to realize about Christ. When he talked about how the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. He did not see this or they did not see this while Jesus was among them. It was when they had gone through that disappointment and the spirit of God was able to illuminate their minds. And then looking back, they realized what and who was in their presence. They began to see it and say, wow, the word was actually made flesh. It dwelled among us and we beheld his glory, uh, um, this grace and this truth. And this is what God is endeavoring would be seen today. That the word would be made flesh that all of what people cannot understand about the gospel, that they could see it being carried out in your life, that they can see it demonstrated um, as they see you, not necessarily always dealing with them, but as they see you in public, 
there are people, you have made a profession of Christ and people are watching you on your jobs. They're not necessarily intending to watch you, but you have become a spectacle wherever place you are. And people are watching how you're responding to things. They're watching how uh, when people say things to you, that's a little off color. They want to see what is going to be your reaction. They've heard you talk about God, but now they want to see how it's going to be demonstrated. And as they see how you deal with things and how you move and, and what you talk about and how you dress and what you say and don't say, what you watch and what you don't watch, then they began to understand something of the practicality of the gospel that they have not seen in their lives or in the lives of those who profess Christianity. They want to see how you respond when a scantily dressed woman walks by. They notice the woman, but they want to notice, do you notice her? They're looking and seeing why you're not looking. Because they want to begin to understand what is this that's causing you to make these choices. And so when you finally speak, then they're able to put the gospel together with the personality. And it won't be a contradiction. The world has seen too many contradictions of Christianity. But God is allowing things to happen where he's removing the contradictions. And he's wanting to bring his people in contact with the people. Notice what it says. This is John's experience. He says this in the first epistle of John, verse one, when you have amen. The Bible says that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have what? Handled of the word of life for the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have what? Fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his son, Jesus Christ. John did not speak about Christ as someone that he heard about from a sermon or the lips of a preacher. He didn't know Jesus by rumor. He actually knew him by his own experience. He says, we've handled this. We've seen it. That which was from the beginning, that which man cannot even conceptualize, we've actually seen it, we've handled it, and we have experienced it. And we have now come to declare, not just in words, but indeed that experience. And this is how John addresses the church. When you look at that woman in um, the Song of Solomon, I was thinking about her uh, this week. And as you look at that woman in the Song of Solomon, which is a symbol of God's church, and you find in her experience where uh, uh, Christ finds her, as it were. She says, I'm black, but I'm comely. In other words, I know that my life is not what it ought to be, but there's a reason why God is still reaching out for me. I'm not necessarily uh, uh, attractive in the sense of the world, but there's something that Christ has reached down and is willing to embrace me and begin this walk with me. But then she comes to a point in her experience where she knows who Christ is, but she has not yet developed a, she has not yet come to the point where she can hold on to him. She can listen to him in a sermon. She can read him in the word, but all of a sudden when she closes the book and she gets out on the highway, she tends to lose sight of him. She can read about him in the morning and have devotion with him. But when she gets to her job, she seems to lose sight of him. She can study about him, but all of a sudden when she gets around her friends, her worldly friends and family, she tends to lose sight of him. And but but just the fact that she's going to church, she gets a little comfortable 
with being in her condition of darkness, but yet having an intellectual knowledge. Oh, I know who Jesus is. I can quote passages. I can debate. I can, I can show you where you're wrong, but yet not realizing when Christ comes to her in a uh, song of Solomon, just take it. We're not going there, but in song of Solomon five, it comes to her and here she is laying in the bed. Here she is asleep. She's comfortable. And Christ is trying to awaken her out of this condition. But she's like, no, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable now. I've, I've gotten into a comfortable position. And you know how it is when you get in bed and it gets comfortable. And you've been fighting for that, that spot. And you've been moving and rolling around and trying to get that comfortable position. And all of a sudden, someone needs you in the other room. You know how you've been in that position before. Amen. And you, you don't want to move. And this is the position that God's church, we are told in Revelation, is coming, has gotten to. She has gotten into a comfortable position. She has been accepted by the world. She's been, she's, she's, she's received awards from the world. She's recognized for her prestige and, and for her health and all these things she's recognized, but she's comfortable and not realizing she's in a condition that Christ is trying to call her out of. But the interesting thing about the woman as she as she breaks out of this paralyzing state, she runs to find Christ. And then the Bible mentions that she is encountered by individuals who 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 themselves are professing. They 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 know Jesus, but they are uncomfortable with the fact that she talks about him like she really knows him. And they began to ridicule her and they even challenge her with saying, what is your beloved more than mine? I mean, we go to the same church. We profess the same faith. Why is it that you feel that you have to do this when I'm satisfied doing nothing? I'm satisfied with just having an intellectual understanding of Jesus, but you feel as though there's something more that we should be doing. Why is that? And the interesting thing about this woman, this church, this experience, these people is that she begins to immediately describe who Christ is. She identifies who this person is. She's seeking from head to toe. And she says that he is not just one of many. She says he is above them all. He is the chiefest of 10,000. And because of her description of her, her, her practical understanding, her detailed information about Christ, they say, wow, where's your beloved that I may go and find him too? I want to seek him with you. And this is the experience that God is going to grant to those who recognize their true condition. They recognize that they have been spending their wheels in the mud. You ever got stuck or ever try to help someone get out? And the more they hit the gas, the deeper they go. And this is what in this generation, this is what we're doing. We're hitting the gas and the more we spend, the deeper we go. The only way to get out of that mud, something solid has to get under that wheel. Something solid has to plant that wheel to lift it out of that condition. And that solidness is Christ. What well, we got to realize we're stuck. We have to realize that all of this profession can't save anybody, can't save us. All of this profession, all of this this information that we've been, that we have and that we have access to is not changing the landscape. And until we come to that point, then there's nothing the Spirit of God can really do for us because we're satisfied in the condition that we're in. Like it says in John chapter 8, Abraham is our father. We have the spirit of prophecy. We have the prophecies. We have all of these things. We have even gone so far as to, we have gone so far as to uh, uh, gain copyrights over the, these things to where no one can use it but us. 
And if someone would, 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 would dare try to use it, we'll sue them. We, 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 we identify with so much that it is legally ours, even if we don't want to believe it. But we have to, but God wants to bring us to a point where we recognize that what God is looking for, we are not producing. Let's go in our Bibles to Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. And let's look at this parable and let's see where the Lord, where we can build and understand these things. God's intent with the giving of truth is not that it would cause us to be heady and high minded while still being lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. No, God has given us truth that he said, uh, as, as uh, 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 David says, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his ways? By doing what? Come on now, we're in school. By what? Taking heed thereto according to thy word. Not just hearing it, but actually taking heed to it. Actually walking in the light that God is bestowing upon our pathway. Because when we look here at this particular parable in Luke 13, we started this last week and we talked about how Jesus, how these individuals, <clears throat> excuse me, had come to Christ and they said, Lord, Pilate had just killed some individuals, some Galileans, and they were somewhat satisfied that they were permitted to live and these died because they felt that the destruction of these individuals was because of some sin that they had done. Just like we said that oftentimes we will look at natural, natural calamities and we will look at what's happening throughout the earth and we would say, well, this is a result of their sinful lives. We look at what happened in various places and we say, well, this is the result of putting God out. And this is why this is happening because God has not been permitted to be there. And then we would come over and, and believe that just because we have the Ten Commandments behind us that God is with us. Not knowing that they are guilty of the same sins that they're accusing others as being punished for. They put God out. And then you go to their churches and you listen to their preaching. You say, well, well, you put God out too. You just still have the form, but you have denied the power thereof. So Jesus looks at them and Jesus says this in verse two. Suppose ye, Luke 13, verse two, suppose ye that these Galileans were what? Sinners above all the Galileans because they suffer such things? Verse three, I tell you what, nay or no, but except what? You repent, you shall all likewise perish. Jesus turns and he says, I'm not even going to deal with the Galileans, I'm dealing with you. Except you repent, you shall likewise perish. Remember in the book of Luke when Jesus was being led to Calvary, and as he's being led to Calvary, there are some women Dark women weeping for him. And we, are, and, we, and we understand that they were not weeping because he was the Messiah. They were not weeping because he was the chosen, chosen of God. It was human sympathy that led them to break forth in these tears. And Jesus, as it were, not concerned with his death, looks at them and said, daughters, don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves. Weep for your children. Because the condition that you're in doesn't even, it doesn't compare. He says if they do this to a green tree, if they do this to someone who has done nothing but brought blessings, what are they going to do to a church that has been an imposter all this time? And this is what he's doing. He's, he's saying, that, look, they've done, they're doing this to me and they realize that there is no fault in me. But what do you think they're going to do to you? And so Christ recognizes that his death was necessary. And so weeping for him was not, was not something that he necessarily needed at that particular time. When he needed the sympathy of the church, it wasn't there. 
when he was in the garden of Gethsemane and he was asking them to pray, he couldn't get their prayers. But now that he had put him, now that he has been in this position, he says, don't weep for me, weep for yourselves. And this is in this particular parable, we're going to find out what God is saying. This is why you should be weeping for yourselves. This is why you should be concerned about your own condition because I have placed you in some of the most favorable places known to mankind and you are not producing. As a church at large, we can look and say, wow, they're not producing, but we have to let everybody fade to black and we have to look at our own individual lives and ask ourselves the question, am I producing all that God intends for me to be producing? as an individual, because we understand that we're not going to be judged by where we are, nor by where we were, but we are going to be judged by where we ought to be if we had consumed and used all of the privileges that God has blessed us with. That's where we're going to be looked at from. And so with that in mind, I really don't have a whole lot of time to be focusing on others' inconsistencies to a great degree. We ought to reprove, we ought to rebuke, but with all long suffering, but yet it's still, we must recognize, am I still moving forward? Am I still progressing or do I get comfortable because I see that they have stopped? And we measure success, not by keeping their eyes on Christ, but I want to do just enough to stay ahead of him. I'll do just enough to stay ahead of her. And I may look over and say, wow, you know what? My wife is still sleeping and I'm having devotion. Amen. And we judge ourselves by what we see others not doing. Are you with me? Rather than focusing on, Lord, what has thou asked me? What has thou bid me or asked me to do? Notice, here we are still in Luke 13. He says... And then he mentioned something else that happened in verse four. All right. Now think about in verse one, Pilate had brought about the death of these individuals. That was a, that was war. That was some political strife that brought about the death of individuals. Here in verse eight, verse four, he says, or, or those 18 upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that, think ye, that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem. This is a natural calamity. He says, I tell you what, nay, but except what? You repent, ye shall all what? Likewise perish. God says, don't look at these natural calamities. Don't look at this political war and strife and try to assume that this is a judgment from God. What happened? What do we find in the book of Job? We find Job living faithfully and yet suffering natural calamities, suffering political strife. And his friends were accusing him of being on the devil's side. And so we cannot rightly look at these things and always say, this is a judgment of God. Satan is using these elements of nature and these natural calamities to get individuals to turn their backs on God. Remember, what was the point of targeting Job? He wanted Job to what? Curse God. He wanted God, he wanted Job to turn his back on God. And so when we see individuals questioning God with these calamities, Satan says, yes, this is what I'm looking for. This is the intent of these things and we cannot feed into it by making people believe that God is interested in bringing about the destruction of his children that he sent his son to die that they might be saved. Are we together? Yeah. Notice what he says. And verse six, and he says, he spake also this parable, a certain man planted a what? Had a fig tree planted it in his vineyard, and he came and sought what? Fruit thereon, and found 
None. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah 61. Notice what it says, Isaiah chapter 61. This is the intent that God has when he brings and gives to us the gospel. When we look at the vineyard, the vineyard can be, is, can be synonymous with the church. But we must not look at this just as a physical building or a physical association, but we must see the benefits of being associated with the gospel. The benefits that God gives to us as a result of receiving and accepting the truth. This is what God is looking at. He's not necessarily looking at the physical building you're attending, but he's seeing, are you taking advantage and are you drinking in the blessings that have come as a result of the gospel that he has given to us, the truth that he has bestowed upon us, the knowledge that God has given to us. It says in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 61, Isaiah 61, and notice what God is intending or desiring you and I to be. It says Isaiah 61 verse 3. Are you there? Amen. The Bible says to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called what? Trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be what? All right. So God is, is in, in delivering the children of Israel from Egypt. He is talking here, but yet in a more practical way in God delivering us from sin, it is his intent that you and I would be productive trees in the garden of God, bearing fruit that those who would come would be able to partake of the fruit rather than being an empty vine that bringeth forth no fruit rather than having just the pretentious leaves of prosperity, but through an examination, realizing that there's nothing there to feed the soul. Just formality. This is not what God intends from us. Notice what our Bible says in the book of Isaiah chapter five. Let's go to Isaiah chapter five. Notice what it says. God's intent for us. We see the children of Israel as a whole, but let's not forget that God has an intent for you and I. There's something that God is looking for from us, not just the pretentious leaves of righteousness, but God wants us to be bearers of fruit. Now it's interesting. He uses a fig tree. When you first see a fig or a figs being referenced to, it's in the book of Genesis. When Adam had lost the covering of God and he and, and he and his wife ran and grabbed what? Fig leaves. Fig leaves, the pretentious fig leaves to give off some semblance of light, some covering that would be able to hide them. Now, you have to understand Adam's massive mind. Adam had a mind that was able to understand nature like no uh, 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 herbalist today. He knew what these trees could do. He knew what would come from these trees. And in his mind of all the things in the garden that he could have grabbed, he grabbed that fig tree, intending that this would cause or give some semblance of glory that would be able to disguise or hide his sins from God. It wasn't each other they were trying to cover themselves and hide from. It was actually God because they both, the Bible says they both knew that they were naked. So they weren't trying to hide from each other. Ananias and Sapphira were not trying to deceive each other. They were trying to deceive God. And so here we find the first place in the Bible where these fig leaves are used. But you find in other places where God speaks to the fig as something that was to be a blessing. When you look at Nathaniel, when God, when Nathaniel came to Jesus, God says, I saw thee sitting where? Under the fig tree. A man in whom there is no guile. And so God is intending something when, when Isaiah 
was when, when, pardon me, when Hezekiah had got sick and the boils began to break out. And God says, prepare your home, get, set your house in order, you're about to die. What did he tell Isaiah to go and get? A lump of figs. And that those figs were going to relieve him of that sickness. And so God was intending that you and I would be able to go into society that was sick and dead in sins and bring life and power and revive that place. This is what God intended. We said last week, if you were driving in a wilderness and you were uh, uh, and you're driving and you can look at the trees, you would notice the trees are the greenest that's closest to the stream. But all the other trees are, are going through their natural uh, uh, change of colors during the time of fall. The ones closest to the stream holds on to their, retains their color the longest. Thus, God is intending that when you look in the world, that those living closest to the stream would be identified and separated from all the trees of the forest. You and I, God intends to be the closest to the stream of life and he intends that our life should bear something different than everything else that's further away from it. There's something that God is looking for from us and it is with this intent that God is bringing people into our pathway. God is bringing people close to us. But rather than experiencing and doing for God what we ought to do, we are starting to look to ourselves. God brings people into our lives to be blessings. And before you know it, we want to take them from God before God can do anything with them. God bring. Yeah, I believe God brought her into my life for you to introduce her to me. Look, I, I believe the Lord allowed me to meet him. I know so that you can introduce him to me. But what's happening is, is we're taking it for ourselves. When Hezekiah was healed as a result of the fig and God brought uh, Babylon down to Jerusalem to see the glory of God, what did, what did, what did Hezekiah do? Hezekiah showed him everything. Isaiah had to come back and say, uh, what did they see in thy house? He said, man, I showed them everything. I showed, I mean, he, he was proud of what he had. Showed them the colleges, showed them the hospitals, showed them the prosperity, showed them the bank account. Let them see everything that they had as a result of the gospel. And he says, you know what? Everything you have, they're going to come and take it. And Hezekiah and his proud say, hey, well, at least in my day, it'll be peace. I'll let that generation deal with that. But God says everything in your house, they're going to take. And all that we have boasted to the world of having different than them, guess what? They're going to take it. God is letting us know through this, they're going to take it. And so you, God is, is intent for you and I individually is that we would be a stream of life wherever we are. On our jobs, in our homes, our occupations, that we would be that stream of life. This is God's purpose for you and I in delivering us from sin. In delivering us from the bondage of sin that the world would be able to look at us and begin to inquire why so different. And this wisdom and this knowledge would not be the result of our own ingenuity, but of the principles that have been delivered to us. Notice what Isaiah chapter 5 says. Isaiah chapter 5, and let's look at verse 1. Isaiah 5, looking at verse 1, the Bible says, now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My beloved hath a vineyard in a very what? All right, a very fruitful hill. Remember, we talked about that fruit, right? We talked about Joseph. The uh, uh, God mentioned in Genesis 49 that Joseph was a fruitful bough. He was a fruitful vine. Where was he, where was he fruitful at? 
Egypt. Was he a stream of life? Yes. What about Daniel? Was Daniel a stream of life in Babylon? Yes. When Daniel's account was taken up, when his, his auditors came and checked his books, was they clean? Everything was clean about them. I was talking with a, uh, an officer when I was in New York. It was a, uh, he, was a, um, he worked at the court, but he was uh, police. And he was given a testimony one time. And he said, you know, he says, my wife and I, we went to do our taxes. And he says, as we sat down with the gentleman, we went to do our taxes. He started showing us how we can save money. And he says he refused to tell the little white lies that the, the, the CPA was recommending to save them more taxes. Hey, just say this. He said, no, I can't do that. And the guy was kind of getting a little frustrated, went on and showed him some other things. And he said, man, what's wrong? You, you don't want money? He said, no, I'm a Christian. And he says, I need to be honest in all things. And he said, the man just kind of sat back. And he was, he, he, the man was obviously convicted and apologized for making those suggestions. A stream of life in everything, brothers and sisters, we do. We're not trying to get rich. Why? It's all going to perish. What did Peter say? Silver and gold have I none. Hey, I'm bringing you this, uh, 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 Peter. I've sold my home. I'm bringing you this. He says, hey, man, when it was in your hands, wasn't it in your power? You ain't got to lie to God. God doesn't need this to forward his work. Matter of fact, hey, take it with you. And he fell and gave up the ghost. So the, the, the world has a mentality concerning prosperity that God doesn't, his, that he doesn't teach his people. When Achan brought that Babylonian garment and he brought that wedge of gold, God said, no, 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 we don't need that. Bury him with it. He doesn't need it. There was a lesson that God was trying to teach his people. And oftentimes God brings us in contact with prosperity. For what purpose? We're a spectacle to the world. He wants to show the world this. It's, it's not about this. But too often we seize upon it. Only for it to turn to ashes upon our lips. And so God says, I have a very fruitful hill. Why? How do you know that the gospel is fruitful? Just look at, the, look at those who partook of it. Was Samson a fruitful bow by a well? We studied that this morning. Samson wasn't fruitful. He wasn't fruitful at all. You can look all the way, brothers and sisters, from the book of Judges, and you do not find fruitfulness. You find the blade coming up. You find the blade coming up with Gideon, but it withered away. After a time. Why? Because what he brought to himself, it became a stumbling block to his home. Led the people back into deeper apostasy. Samuel, was he a fruitful well? Yes, he was. Samuel was surrounded by, by negative influences. He didn't have his parents there saying, no, Samuel, no, 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 don't do that. But he learned enough in his home that even when his parents weren't around, did he still make right decisions? So much so that the Bible says not one of his words fell to the ground. This is the example. So when God is looking at it, you and me, and we are coming up with excuses of why we cannot be productive in society, God says, no, 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 the hill is fruitful. And, and, and he can look through his word and look throughout history and we can see individuals that partook of the gospel and they flourished. We are told in inspiration that Daniel in the courts of Babylon walked with God as did Enoch. So the, the, the excuses for not being or living up to the high standard that God has given us is no excuse. And we must not accept excuses from the flesh. When the flesh says you've done enough, when the flesh said you've prayed enough, 
When the flesh said you have done all you need to do, we cannot accept that from the flesh, can we? Because the Bible says that Jesus, he humbled himself and became, and he humbled himself and he took upon the form of a servant. That was humiliating enough. The mere fact that God would take on humanity after 4,000 years of backsliding, we are told that even if Christ would have took on Adam's nature before the fall, it would have been humiliating. But to do it after 4,000 years of sin, you would say, like, like Satan came to him and said, you know what? You have done enough. You need not go through with this. This humiliation is all you have to do. But he knew that he had to go to the cross. And Paul says that he, he humbled himself even to the death of the cross. If just becoming human wasn't humiliating enough, but to hang on a cross, naked, shameful, before the entire world. This is what Jesus had to do in order to save you and me. That humiliation wasn't because of himself. It was a humiliation to teach us this is what sin makes us in the sight of God. When God came to Adam and Eve in the garden, what did they say? They were, come on now. When he came to the garden, he said, where art thou? They said, Lord, we hid because we were naked. Jesus hung on the cross. They took his garments from him. It was a shameful experience to die on the cross. Not these Michelangelo paintings we're used to seeing. But it was a shameful humiliation to die on the cross. And this is how Jesus died as sin makes us. He died naked. This is how he was before God, suffering for us. And then we come before God in the stench of our filthy rags. Brothers and sisters, if you have a marginal reference, look up that marginal reference for filthy rags. Amen. Here it is, Isaiah 5. Notice what it says. Isaiah 5, verse 2. He says, notice what God says. He said he what? Fenced it and gathered out the what? Stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, not sour grapes, but grapes, brothers and sisters, the, 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 the pure blood of the grape. And it brought forth what? Wild grapes. Hold your, we, we're, we're going to come back here, but go in your Bibles to the book of Psalms. Psalms, the 80th division. God says he gathered out the stones thereof. Go in your Bibles to the book of Psalms, the 80th division. Psalms 80, and I want us to notice what it says beginning in verse 8. Psalms 80, beginning in verse 8. Psalms, the 80th division, as David makes reference to this vine that God transplanted from Egypt and how God planted it. Because when God gathered out the stones thereof, God was separating us from the nations. God was dividing us from among the people. And we must understand, like we talked about last week, is that God's separation is not a separation of you simply being uh, living on an island, not dealing with individuals, but we said that that word separated means wonderful. God was wanting to make us a wonderful people, wonderful in knowledge, wonderful in skill, Wonderful in understanding what God made Daniel 10 times wiser. He was more wonderful. This is what God wanted to make us. And we still today wants to make you and I. Because God is standing at the door of our hearts. What? And he wants to come in. God wants to make us a wonderful people. Peculiar not peculiar because we're strange and we don't talk to people, but peculiar in the way that we deal with life's problems. 
Rather than retreating, we actually press the battle to the gate. We find ways to get in the, the presence of people. Why? Because God has solutions for every problem. Rather than sitting on the fence and just praying that prophecy will be fulfilled, praying that the mark of the beast will come, praying that time of trouble will come, God would have us to go to be a lifesaver. Pray that God will continue to hold the winds. But we're sitting on the fence, waiting for prophecy to fulfill, waiting for the time of trouble like we're ready for it, waiting for, for all of these calamities to be announced, we're waiting for it. We're waiting for the authorities to come and knock on our door like we're going to do something great. But God is telling us or wanting us to be in a position where we can actually remember what Daniel said to, to Nebuchadnezzar. He said, Nebuchadnezzar, break off thy sins by righteousness that thy tranquility, thy rest, thy peace can be lengthened. Daniel knew about prophecy, but he understood that Nebuchadnezzar, your peace can be extended if you would just break off your sins by righteousness. If you turn from this iniquity, and he went on to say, and if you would just show mercy to the poor. If you would stop consuming and taking off for yourself and creating an environment because Babylon created an environment where Cyrus and the Medo-Persians rose up against them because of Babylon's tyranny. Are you with me? This strife that is being created in the world, God has prophesied that it will come about, but it is coming about because of oppression and because of tyranny. Cyrus came, as it were, to deliver them from the, from the galling yoke of Babylon. This is what he wanted to break them from. What did, what did um, Jeroboam, what did, what, no, 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 Rehoboam, what did Rehoboam tell the people? They came and said, make our yoke lighter. He said, lighter? He said, man, my father chastised you with whips, I'm going to do it with scorpions. I'm going to show that my finger is more heavier than my father's hand. And why did they rise up? Oppression. In society today, we're seeing the, 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 the principles of the French Revolution being enacted, and we're seeing war and strife and, and picketing, and we're seeing all of this, uh, 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 these protests because of what? Oppression. But the, the tranquility, the peace, if they would just break off their sins by righteousness. And when I say righteousness, brothers, I'm not talking about putting on a suit and going to church. Righteousness is what? Right? Doing. Doing what is right. Administering justice, true justice. Notice Psalms 80, Psalms 80, Psalms 80. Notice what it says, beginning in verse 8. Are you there? Amen. The Bible said, well, look at verse 7. It says, turn us again, O God of hosts, and cause thy face to what? And we shall be saved. Thou hast brought a vine out of Egypt. Thou hast cast out the what? Heathens or the nations that did not serve God. He cast them out. And God said he planted it. Thou preparest room before it, and didst cause it to do what? Take deep root, and it filled the land. The hills were covered with the, with the shadow of it, and the bowls thereof were like the goodly cedars. She sent out her bowls unto the sea, and her branches, what? In other words, God is showing that this plant, as, it, as, it, as he planted it, it actually took over. It actually started to go beyond its borders, and it began to draw life from the sea, draw life from the nations around it, and it sent it out to the rivers. In other words, it was at one time, it was a blessing. At one time, it was feeding the people. At one time, it was being productive in society, but it will get to a point where God says he's going to have to, he's going to, have to break it down. 
Because while it is, while it has consumed all of Canaan, it has now become an unproductive plant. It's drawing all of the life out of the soil and it's not putting anything back. Generation after generation is getting worse and worse. They're not producing children. They're not producing offspring that know me, but they're actually producing offspring that's going after the world. The church, we said, is constantly being robbed of the productive wisdom that would cause God's church to be a blessing. The world is getting it. The world is using all of, and we're having to go to the world and ask them to come and help us. Can you come and build us this? Can you come and teach us this? Can you come and do this for us? But God intended that the church would be the head and what? Not the tail. Now again, now again, understand this, brothers and sisters, we're not talking about the church at large now. We have to look at ourselves individually and we have to ask ourselves, are we the best at what we do? I'm not talking about you being better than anyone, but I'm just talking about, are you the best at what you do? And that's something I want you to think about. Again, you're not on your job trying to be better than anyone, but the fact that you have access to he that inhabits eternity. Are you the best at what you do? And this is what we have to start considering. Am I the best at what I do? Because I'm giving, I'm doing my best for the master. Or have I accepted the standards of other people? You know, when you look at institutions around in this country, I don't know about the world, but in this country, I was talking with a judge one time and he said, you know, I used to work for the board of accreditation. And he said, you know, we would call around and we would call schools and remind them, hey, you know, it's time for you to be accredited. You know, it's a, no, it's the time for you to, you know, make sure that your accreditation things are up to speed. And he said he would call around to the different colleges. And he said, you know, I called Harvard. And I said, you know, we, we, we notice here that, you know, and, and he said the guy was almost confused on the phone with him. He said, what are you talking about? He says, well, I'm from the board of accreditation. He said, uh, you must have the wrong number. Wrong number? He said, yes. He says, we're not accredited. He says, we are the standard of accreditation. He's, oh, excuse me, sorry. And he hung up the phone. And I said, wow. He said, they're not accredited. He said, they're the standard for accreditation. We judge accreditation by what they're doing. And I said, wow. And so I, I, I went and actually looked at a Harvard, Harvard application. And I looked at that just in comparison because I was studying about Babylon and about their educational system. And the interesting thing is, whatever stand, Babylon had a high standard. You can just be smart. They wanted you to be pretty. There's, I mean, they, there's things they want. They wanted you to be well rounded when it came to understanding. And yet in all of that, even the Bible makes reference to the wisdom in Egypt. I believe it's first Kings chapter 30. I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, but anyway, it, it, it makes reference to how Solomon was wiser than all the children of the East and it mentions Egypt. And this is what Daniel for he didn't just exceed their standards. He far exceeded their standards. Because it wasn't like he was like me when I was in high school. You know, I would ask the teacher, what do I have to do to pass? You need a 65. Well, that's what you won't get from me. If it's a 65 that I need to graduate, you get in a 65. If you raise it to 67, I'm a push for the 67, but I am not striving for no 80 and 85. You're not going to, I was, I was, I was content with doing just enough to move on. But that's not what Daniel was. And this is what we cannot be 
in our professional lives because it will come back over into our what? Spiritual life. And we will constantly only do enough to think we're pleasing God only to end up being spewed out. We have to go beyond what man's expectations are. We have to far exceed their expectations. Why? Because who are we representing? Not the job you're representing heaven. You're not representing your organization. I'm representing heaven. And so when you see, so this is why God places us in a position to be productive bows. Productive, why? Because through your production, now when you begin to talk about God, they'll say, I'll listen to you. Why? Because I don't see you cursing. You don't steal pens. You ain't stealing paper clips. You're not coming back late from the breaks like everybody else is. You're not sitting around here gossiping. You're not sitting around here talking about all this trash. You're not sitting, I, 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 I go by your computer and you don't have to hurry up and turn it off and switch the screen. You know exactly what needs to be done and you're doing it without being told. So now when it comes to things of religion, I'll listen to you because of your integrity. Are you with me? And God will give you a mouth and wisdom that your enemies can never gainsay or resist. Not just brothers and sisters in the church. We, 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 we master being good in the church. We master knowing how to give answers in the church. But brothers and sisters, God wants us to advance. God wants us to be productive. He wants us to be the best at what we do. And we shouldn't settle for anything less. It says here, and, and let's go back to Isaiah 5. Let's go back to Isaiah 5. And let's, 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 uh, make this plain announcement. We are about to make our final descent. All right, notice what it says, Isaiah 5. Isaiah chapter 5. I want us to notice what it says, brothers and sisters. Because again, in us being a witness to society and us showing society what it is, what, 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 who God is like, that is a tall order. You read in the book, Desire of Ages, that Jesus was not even defective in the handling of tools. He was as perfect a workman as he was in character. And as we said before, can you imagine getting a chair from Christ? You took him a chair that had a little squeak in it. And when you got it back, it was as perfect as he was in character. When, when Bezalel in the Holy Ab had to go into the sanctuary and build, God didn't just give them the plan and say, go build. No, God said, I gave them my spirit. I gave them wisdom, I gave them understanding. And then it was of such, now again, they wasn't in there saying, well, what does he want almonds on this for? That don't even make sense. You know what? Just put one on the front. Ain't nobody looking around the backside. Just put an arm in here and put an arm in there. And let's get up out of here. No, no, no. That's what, he wasn't in there doing that. He put as many almonds on that candlestick as God told him to. He put as many flowers, many not. Everything that those plans said that, he, that God says, this is, this is how I want it. It was exactly the way that God wanted. So much so that God was able to come down and say, yes, I will rest in this building. Everything we have should be the best. Not because we're trying to be better than anybody, but because we know who we want to be in it. Amen? Amen. I want Jesus to get in it. So therefore, I must make sure it is the best that it could be so that God could feel comfortable in it. And if God is comfortable in it, everyone who is of God will also feel the same comfort when they come. Everything we should have and we should encourage and provoke each other to take it a step higher, to go higher. We should constantly not accept mediocre standards when it comes to anything that we do. Amen? If there's correction that we need, then when someone brings us the correction, I don't take it to heart, what is it? Because I, rec I, rep I recognize, not only do I represent God, I, rec I represent you. I, rep I represent my home. 
I type up letters. My wife says, dun, 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 honey, dun, 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 don't press send. Let me see that before you press send. And I had, go get your mother before I send this thing off. And she comes and she corrects it and puts the apostrophes and takes this word out and puts commas. And, and I say, oh, wow. And you send it off and then people come and they say, wow. And they're looking at you like you're all intelligent. And amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> but your wife has checked it off. Why? Because she's like, no, no, no. You ain't, you ain't sending that email out. Too many thousand. Duh, no, 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 no. You, this is how it should be done. Why? Because we are representing each other and we're representing God. And we should constantly, Paul says, provoke each other to good works. And as long as we're with each other, we should recognize that, guess what? I am representing the King of Kings. He says here in the book of Isaiah chapter 5, Isaiah chapter 5, he says, God says that he looked that it should bring forth grapes and it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O oh, inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, God says, I pray you betwixt what? Me and my what could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it. Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth one wild grapes. He says in verse five, and now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. He says, watch this, I will do what? I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, broken down, uh, uh, and, broke, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. Now, I want you to notice, brothers and sisters, what God is telling us here. God says, as a result of the unproductive tree, he says, I am going to do what? Take it down. But if you go back with me, go back with me very quickly to Luke, thir Luke 13, Luke chapter 13. I want you to notice what God says. Now, remember, God says he's going to take away the what? Hedge from about it. Notice what he says in Luke 13, Luke chapter 13. I want us to see because God is trying to bring his people in sympathy and in harmony with his desire for the church, everyone that has received the gospel are not unproductive trees. Everyone in the garden of God is not unproductive, but there are some unproductive ones. But notice, I want you to understand that as God is speaking here, God is saying what he's got to do to the tree, but he is actually trying to strike a chord with you and me. He's actually trying to strike a chord with us. Notice, he says in Luke 13, God mentions what he has come to this tree looking for, and he's, he's done everything that he possibly could. And he says in verse 7, Then said he unto the dresser of the vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and what? Find none. Do what? Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? So now, question, does the, the owner of the vineyard, does he want fruit from the tree? Because he's invested into the tree. He put, he, he, he did all these things. He went and got the tree and he bought it and he brought it back for the purpose of bearing fruit. This is why he planted it. This is why he invested his money in it. So he doesn't really want to cut it down, but he doesn't want it to keep sucking life out of the earth because it will destroy not just himself, but everything else around it. But notice what the dresser says in verse eight. And he answering and said unto him, Lord, do what? Let it alone this year also. Till I shall do what? Take about it and, all right. You know the scriptures, but I'll read them just for, for, uh, so you can have them. Notice what it says in Luke, I mean, not Luke, John 3, John 3, verse 16, 17. Notice what he says. We know the passage, but it says in John 3, you could actually quote it if you want to. You know it, right? John 3, 16, what does it say? For God so that he won. 
that should not but everlasting. What does verse 17 say? Ah, see, we don't we don't go to 17. We just memorize 16. But notice verse 17. For God sent not his son into the world to what? But that the world through him might be. We understand. Wait a minute. It says in James 4, 4, you adulteresses and you adulterers and adulteresses. Know ye not that the friendship of the world is what? Enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the. So who did God send his son to save? His enemies. Paul says, while we were yet in sin, Christ died for us. While we were alienated from the promises of God, while we were going astray, while we were headlong, determined to go to, to, to as they say, to bust hell open, God sent his son to save us. God sent his son to speak to us. You aren't in church, so that's not where God met you. Amen. He met you on the outside. He met you walking down the street and he touched you. He met, he met you when you were in that party and you were sitting there saying, wow, is this all to life? And it was there that God sent his angel and he spoke to you. It was there that he pierced through that, that those headphones when you were listening to that demonic music. God turned down the volume and spoke to you. And you heard his voice. And you became unsettled with the life that you were living. And what happens is many times we feel as though that God is not able to talk to us while we're, while, while we're struggling sometimes. But we fail to realize that it was while we were struggling that God first spoke to us. And we start condemning ourselves when we don't make certain steps as though God is done with us, but we don't realize the investment that God has put into us. We don't realize that all that God has done to get us to this point, and he is not finished with us, even though the devil keeps telling us that God doesn't want us. But he does. And this is why God has put you and I into the world to remind them that God is not finished with them. There are people home right now praying. There are people home right now bowed down before images. There are people right now count, uh, uh, counting beads with, 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 with crosses on the end of it. And we know good and well that that has nothing to do with salvation. But they're counting those beads and they're faithful every single day in counting those beads. And brothers and sisters, God is wanting to reveal himself to them. God is doing his best to, to go beyond the statues and the images and go beyond the, the idols that they have identified with. But God is looking for someone to make up the gap. God is looking for someone, as he found with Christ, someone that would, that would identify with the sympathy of the owner and say, Lord, spare it this year also. This is why God is telling us in the book of Joel, God says, get between the porch and the altar. And do what? Not look, not pray for the condemnation of my people, not pray that Babylon would come, but that God, that someone would get in between and say, Lord, spare thy people. Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thy what? Heritage to reproach. But this is, this is what we don't understand because we have been influenced by the nations around us. God tells us to pray for our leaders. Amen? Amen. Why? Because God can influence our leaders. I'm not just talking about these, 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 these selfish prayers that we pray. All of a sudden now everybody wants to pray for Trump and we didn't want to pray for Obama. Why? Because he supported a lifestyle that we didn't agree with. But the reality is if we are praying, if we're seeking God with all of our hearts, then God will give power to move individuals. But we don't believe it. We're adopting the ideas of people around them. And we're, we're, we're angry at people for decisions they're making, but we're not recognizing that our lack of decision makings is just as, we're just as guilty. Just as guilty, brothers and sisters. So here, someone, Jesus identifies with the dresser. He, he identifies with the owner and he steps in and he says, Lord, spare it this year also. Now, wait a minute. 
God says he's going to do what? He's going to take down the hedge, the protection. Look at what your Bible says in Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 22. Notice what it says. Ezekiel chapter 22. Ezekiel chapter 22, and notice what the Bible tells us here in Ezekiel chapter 22. This is our last scripture. Notice what it says, Ezekiel 22, looking at verse 23. When you have it, amen. I know y'all laughing, amen. This is it. This is really it, Brother Morrell. This is it. Notice, Ezekiel 22, amen. I say this is the last one. Everybody start giggling because they know it's about three or four more in there. But no, notice what it says. Father in heaven, as we look at these last points, help us to be touched with the feelings of our brothers and sisters' infirmities. Lord, may we have a spirit to shield more so than to expose. May we will be willing, Father, to stand in the gap. Give us thy Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Brothers and sisters, I was here in Ezekiel 22. You know, in order for us to do what God, the mind has to be ch changed completely. I was listening, watching a, a, a documentary about Secret Service. And they said in the training of the Secret Service, they said the natural human inclination when trouble come is, it's, is that that emotion kicks in is fear and flight. We get afraid and we want to retreat. Uh, what is it? Fight or flight? Fight or flight. And that's all out of fear. And so the reality is when trouble hits, we almost tense up and we want to run. He says, but with the Secret Service, they have to go through an education that they would not retreat, but they would actually move towards the trouble. They said that is not a natural response from the human nature. So they have to teach them how to move forward when danger comes rather than running, wanting to hide. You know, like the Bible calls them hirelings. When the wolf comes, what do they do? They run. So God says, so, so that training, they move forward. God, the Bible tells in the book of Ezekiel, not Ezekiel, but Isaiah 28. God says, we have to press the battle to the gate. When trouble comes, God is not looking for his people to retreat, but actually to do what? Move forward. He's actually looking for us to move forward. So the mind has to be changed. And how is the mind changed? The Bible says, let this mind be in you, Amen. which was also in Christ Jesus. Amen. This is the mind that has to get control of us. And how do we get the mind of Christ? By beholding, we become changed. Meditating on his word, how often it says in Psalms 1, day and night. And he goes on to say, but the ungodly, they're not so. The ungodly, they're not meditating on the word day and night. They're finding something else to occupy their thoughts. So we have to, as we meditate on the word of God, we want to run, but, God's, but the spirit of God is pulling us. And as we're reading, as we're meditating, when situations arise, when the flesh wants to retreat, the Spirit of God says, move forward. And God will give us wisdom. Notice, here we are in Ezekiel 22. The Bible says in verse 23, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto her, speaking to God's people, thou art the what? Land that is not cleansed, nor rained upon in the day of indignation, there is a what? Conspiracy. Conspiracy of a prophet in the midst of her, midst thereof. Like the roaring lion rave, ravening the prey, they have devoured souls. They have taken the treasure and the precious things. They have made her many widows in the midst thereof. So God is telling Ezekiel, God says, Ezekiel, I want you to understand something. He says, this is not coincidence what you see happening in the church. He says, this is a conspiracy. This is men who have come together to conspire this apostasy. This is not just accidental things you're seeing happening here and happening there and they just stumbled across error. No, 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 no. This is a conspiracy. 
This is something that, that, that has been put in operation with the purpose of dismantling the old paths. Purposely being contrived to dismantle the old paths. He's telling Ezekiel, he said, this is, this, this, this is a conspiracy. He goes on to say, and he says in verse 26, her priests have violated my law have profaned my holy things. They, they put no want. Difference between the want, holy and the want, profane. Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the, and have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths. And I am what? Profane, God says, among them. Her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves ravening the prey, to shed blood and to destroy souls, to, be, to get dishonest gain. And her prophets have what? Daubed them with what? Untempered mortar, seeing vanity and divining lies unto them, saying, thus saith the Lord God, when the Lord have what? Now notice what he's saying. He said, listen, God says, I'm going to tear down the... Walls, I'm going to take down the heads thereof. He said, but these false prophets have come and made God's people believe that nothing is wrong. Everything is as it was. God is still, look, look. And they're, and they, and they're building the walls, but they're not putting any mortar in between them. They're just standing bricks on top of each other. And if you start standing enough bricks on top of each other, eventually it's going to what? It's going to fall and hurt somebody. And God says, this is what they're doing. They're making everyone believe that everything is okay when God has not spoken it. They're crying peace when what? God has not spoken peace. This is a conspiracy. They're, they're, they're planning to do this. They're conspiring this. And then he says, the people of the land have used oppression and exercise robbery and have vexed the poor and the needy. Yea, they have oppressed the strangers wrongfully. Now here it is in verse 30. He says, and I did what? Are you there in verse 30? And I what? Sought for a man among them that should do what? And to do what? Stand in the gap before me for the what? That I should not destroy it. But what does he say? But I found none. God takes away the hedge. He takes down the walls. But God is trying to move upon the sympathies and the hearts of his people. And God is trying to see, does anyone care about my people the way that I do? Does anyone, is anyone concerned with the condition that they're in? Is anyone worried about the fact that they're being eaten up, that they're becoming ravening, they're becoming a prey for ravening wolves? And God says, I'm looking for somebody, but I was not able to what? Find one. Why? Because the ones who to desire to be in the gap, they're only saying enough as not to offend. They're going to do enough. They're going to say something, but they're not going to, they're not going to deal with the situation for fear they don't get invited back. For fear that they get labeled as something. So they're not going to say what's really happening. They're going to focus on what's going on out there. They're going to talk about Trump. They're going to talk about Obama. They're going to talk about the Congress. They're going to talk about the Pope. They're going to talk about black Jesuits. They're going to talk about everything else but what's eating up my people. God says, I'm looking for someone that has a sympathy. And again, the sympathetic cry is not just saying What's wrong, the sympathetic cry is seen in the way we're responding to the problem. What happened when the priest saw the man uh, uh, wounded and half dead on the side of the road? What did he do? Walked away. What happened when the Levite came and saw him? What did he do? When the Samaritan came by, did he look and say, man, how you get like that? Man, look at you. You're naked. What's wrong with you? Man, clean yourself up. Look at what you're doing. Did he do that? No, he saw his condition. What did he do? He got off his own beast. And he began to invest his own time and resources 
into helping this man out of his condition. He sought as much as possible to bind and cover his wounds. He did not want his wounds exposed anymore. He saw these wounds. And the Bible tells us, brothers and sisters, when you look at the story of the rich man and Lazarus, in Luke chapter, I believe it's 16. Are you, is it there? Luke 16. But the Bible talks about that Lazarus he fed sumptuously, but there was a poor beggar at his door named uh, uh, Lazarus. So the rich man, rich man fed sumptuously, and Lazarus was the beggar at his door. And the Bible says, but the dog came and did what to Lazarus' wounds? Lick them. The rich man was content with having this man by his door. He didn't mind. He, he didn't have him random. He said, oh, he's in a bad condition. Just, uh, he's okay. Leave, just leave him alone. And he would allow the dogs to come and lick his wounds. Didn't do anything to cover him. But he was content with seeing him in that condition. And that's many of, many are content with seeing God's people in the condition they're in. They're content with seeing others broken and wounded around them. They're content with listening to others struggle and talk about their bad marriages, and we say nothing about it. They're struggling with their kids, and they're, 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 they're letting us know the suffering they're going through, and all we can do is just shake our head and just let them be. But we won't say anything. We won't try to interject, not because we're trying to get in their business, but because we have the oil and the wine. We have the thing that could bind up their wounds. And we're not going to be justified in leaving them there because the parable goes on to say that when they both ended up before the judgment seat, Lazarus was saved. But the beggar was lost. So we, don't, we can't judge how people are going to end up because of their wounds, but what are we doing about the wounds? Do we see the condition and we're becoming satisfied because we don't think that we have it? God says to the people here in Ezekiel, he said, listen, you're talking about the land resting seven years. He says, you're the ones that's not cleansed. I can fix the land. The land isn't a problem. I could put some amendments in it and build the soil back up and, and, and create productive fruit. He said, but you, you're another case. You're another problem. That's another situation. And brothers and sisters, we cannot sit idly by while we're knowing there are people around us who are hurting. We have to start asking God, Lord, how can you use me? What did Isaiah say when Isaiah realized the condition of his people in his own condition and he heard God speaking as it were and he said, here am I, do what? Send me. And this is what we have to be more concerned about is, Lord, can God use me? Is he willing to use me? Am I surrendering my faults and my, 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 the very things that would cause me to be embarrassed of saying anything? Have I given them to Christ? Because, you know, sometimes we won't say nothing for fear that we might be embarrassed because there's something that we know that we're not doing, right? Sometimes we say, you know, well, I need to get my things in order before I help them. Right? We think about that sometimes, right? Who am I to say something to them when I have this, right? Amen. The thing we have to think about is this. Have I given this to Jesus? Because this is not to be your excuse. This is not to be, no, surrender, give that to Jesus. So now, as you talk, it's not about you being perfect. It's about you being kept by the power of God. It's about you knowing and understanding that God is good and how God is helping you in your situation. Because ultimately, you're not trying to get them to trust in you. You want them to trust in Jesus. Because that's who you're trying to trust in. That's who you're learning to trust in every day. And God is doing what to your steps? Ordering them every day in his word. He's not allowing iniquity to have dominion over you. Your situation may not be the best. But was it the best for Samuel? No. We look at Jacob and we look at his two wives. But Samuel grew up in a house where there were two wives too. And, and Peninnah, we are told, was an adversary 
So we know what type of woman she was. But this is the environment that Samuel grew up in. And yet God still did what? Used him because his mother did not allow his circumstances to be an excuse for sin. Amen. That's good. She didn't focus on what he, his, his, his circumstances. She said, Lord, if you give me one, I'll give them to you. And so we cannot be allowing circumstances to dictate our spiritual success. Give it to Jesus. God is looking for someone to make up the gap. God is looking for someone to stand in it. And brothers and sisters, God wants to use you. He wants to use me. He wants to use us. And those who are watching, he wants to use you as well.